I have the huge honor and privilege today of being in conversation with Priyanka Edicula, who runs Birth Village. India's, uh, it's a freestanding birth center in Cochin, in beautiful Kerala. Priyanka, I think it's fair to say, is a legend, pioneer, pathbreaker, and just uh, somebody who's inspired so many of us with her birth work in India, Asia, and just globally. Um, so it's my immense pleasure, honor, and privilege. Uh, we have so many of your fans here, Priyanka. So uh, take it away. Thank you, Sangeeta. It's a very flattering intro that you gave me, and I don't know how much it is that. Same. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome all of you. Happy VIDM to all of you. Um, it gives me pleasure to really talk about our journey. Um, which, uh, we are there uh, for at least close to 13 years right now, slowly reaching our teenage right now. Um, and in the presentation of my focus today, primarily, is the Entrepreneurship and midwifery. That the audio is not clear. Uh, yes, it's a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's it's break. You're breaking up in parts. Now is it clear? Yes. It's clear. Uh, better. Shall I just go ahead and continue, or do you want me to relog or come up with anything? Shall I just continue? Um. Yeah, just continue. Sound. I think. Yeah. Try. Okay. Is it clear now? Is it comfortable right now? It's slightly choppy, but uh, yeah, we, we can make sense, I think. Priyanka, try, yeah. to hit, try to hit your leave audio and then sign back in. Let's see if that fixes your sound. Okay, I shall try that. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Is it clear now? Here. Hello. Let's hear. Mm, still a bit. Now. Is my voice much louder? Are you using headphones, Priyanka? Yeah, it's on headphones. That's correct. Is there a separate microphone hanging from the headphones? No. Okay. Well, let's see how you sound from here. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to start. Uh, currently, I don't have the icon to um, go forward with the slides. I don't have the plus button from Sangeeta. Is my voice clear? Shall I go ahead? Yeah, I think I'll go yes, ahead. Yes, you've got yeah? it now. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. All right. okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So I shall just uh, continue speaking. If you're not able to hear me, you can just type in the public chat. And for those of you who can't hear me, um, so I'm just going to proceed to the presentation. So I always begin my presentation with a little bit of intro about my country and where I'm coming from. I think that's very important for people in the rest of the world. Um, so basically, I'm obviously representing India. We have here talking 1.3 billion. Uh, that's where we're affected right now. Uh, we also come with 0.7% of the world population, so that's huge. Uh, well, in India, I'm basically coming from down south. You can see the red right at the stage over there, which is Kerala. And we are in many different ways. We are probably the only state in the country. Uh, where we have a sex ratio of 1.84 of females to males, which means the number of women in our, country, in our state is definitely more than men. We have over 10,000 festivals celebrated in the state um, every year. Uh, the National Geographic actually makes Kerala as one of the 10 paradises of the world and 50 must-see destinations of a lifetime. Kerala's literacy rate is also really, really high. Uh, and especially, I would mean, say that we are one of the highest as far as the country is concerned. Uh, we are also, uh, currently, we have the Communist Party in power. And it's also a state where citizens are really involved. Right? Are you all able to hear me so far, or is it still breaking? That's one part of these online conferences that, you know, I'm. Like, I don't really, can't, I'm not able to decipher whether people can kill me completely or not. Can you all hear me so far? Are you with me? Quite broken. Well, I'm really sorry, but I'm doing the best that I can, and I have no idea why it's broken. Okay. But any questions, please type in, right? So we can always collect it at the end of it. Now, going forth. When we go to our next uh, slide, um, one of the interesting things that Kerala faced uh, in 2018, there was on the right side, you can see we had there's this image of true healthcare workers, and you can see a lot of um, image bags being piled up. We had an outbreak in the virus, uh, which was pretty but we have an extremely robust healthcare system that continued pretty equally. And we also had a huge flood, which was all over the news. Um, and it was massive because we lost around 483 people, 140 and about a million people were evacuated in 2018. But in no time, the state was able to rebuild itself, right? So there was huge things that our state faced in one year itself. Um, Kerala prides itself a lot for its healthcare system, but we're going to look a little more deeper as to where midwifery stands amidst all of this, right? So this is something I think all of you are familiar with right now is the pandemic. Um, and uh, again, Kerala has done pretty well as far as uh, containment is concerned. Uh, we are also one of the states that leads in terms of breaking the chain. And I'm sure if you can read it down, if you look up on BBC and look at Kerala healthcare model and how during the pandemic is going for the entire world. Um, now, as we go forward into this slide, now look, despite all the advances we have made, um, we still have strong gaps in our maternity care system. Uh, despite being the second most populous country in the world, I still have to say that independent midwifery still has to be has to make it smart. We're still not there yet. Births are most often than not over medicalized and primarily led by obstetricians in hospitals. Our C section rates are super high. It's between 40 to 80 percent, I would say. And in government hospitals, it's at 30 percent. Now Amidst all this, we have Birth Village, which is a very simple birth center that we have. As you can see, you can see our pictures on the screen in front of you. You can see how our water lo room looks like. You can see how our birth rooms look like. 
Um, and it's taken a lot of effort to reach us to this point uh, where we are standing right now. Um, now, how we did this, our journey uh, from the start is what I'm going to be looking at. Um, my focus will come in. Um, now, when I go, I would like to also go back and there is a section which I think is very important, which is our past, because there is no present and future without our honoring our past. I would like to honor also um, a traditional birth attendant in this slide. You can see there is Kalaksha March. She's there in a small little picture on the left side. Uh, she was a traditional birth attendant who was um, probably attending births till, I guess, till 19, in the 1990s um, in a small slum here. And she's attended, I mean, she has lost count herself, but dozens and dozens and dozens of births right from the age of 14. She is a testament of uh, India's history with the traditional birth attendant. On the right side, you can see a small picture which says British India, uh, because in 1902 is when British India introduced midwifery uh, in this country as a profession. It's interesting that the course was scrapped three years after uh, its entry, and it's always a question mark as to why that exactly happened. Uh, currently in our country, we have nurse midwives. Our curriculum uh, is still in the process of uh, our government of upgrading curriculum. Uh, we have a six months training program as part of the uh, bachelor's in nursing course. Right, so that's where we are standing with respect to education. Now, uh, as we look uh, forward uh, as to seeing where we started off. Now, personally, I started off my career as a childbirth educator. I left another profession. I was really inspired uh, to bring childbirth education to the women in my state. I began at a time when nobody really understood what childhood education class was. And this is way back in 2007. Um, it was really hard beginning at this point of time uh, because most of the time the question I would get is why attend class? What's the point of going to a class? Why can't uh, the elders in our family help us? Um, so there was a lot of barriers to break as far as that was concerned. Um, so when initially when I started off my batches, my batches really didn't go that pretty well. My first four batches, I would say, were complete disasters because they just kept having C-sections after another. From that point, uh, I saw couples attending births in hospitals. It was definitely an improvement. And in 2010, when I sat for one classes, um, one of the, my mamas in class said, I want to have a baby in Washington. I said, why not? We facilitated and worked on the first midwife-led birth in a hospital premise, and it went remarkably well for her. But it was really heartbreaking for me, and I'll explain why that was. So I've still not forgotten their horrific gasps as she released her bubbles as she was having a baby. I realized. Hello, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I just, I just heard the voice in the chain. Sorry. Yeah, I realized how little respect we had for natural physiology of birth. Along uh, at that point of time, uh, there was another full term baby born with anomalies, and we all know babies don't have to be born perfect. And this bar probably had an hour or so. But what really hit me at, again at that point of time was uh, how my mother never held that baby and she was weaned off quickly while this baby was placed in a plastic container. And everybody, right from medical personnel to janitors, to cleaning, stood with this little one at two hours. I want to hold it or say goodbye. It was such a reflection of how cold we are in the medical. And as a community, and I was very clear in my mind that we needed to have a facility that would respect women's choices, where she would lead the way with no one else uh, really telling her what to do and that her voice should be supreme. 
And that's how I began my midwifery journey with the National College of Midwifery in the United States. It was really arduous, I would say, because I was a student and a director and running my center from in 2010. Um, it was kind of, I was kind of thinking uh, all at the same time. Uh, as one of my preceptors in midwifery coaches, uh, she never had to report to her student. Um, it was definitely trying times, but I think we all pulled through it, uh, and it's been 10 years since then. As we move along, now I'm sure a lot of you um, midwives are who are attending this, you're all, you know, you're all big fans of using water for our women. Uh, it's what we call the midwives epidural. And trust me, I don't know how many of you guys would have done this out there. Uh, now, when in the water picture that I put up in the beginning of my presentation, now, when we started our water baths in 2010, we didn't have hot water in our water bath room. We didn't have a line that connected water. So, that's how do we do it? So, what we did is we heated water in the kitchen, which is downstairs. We heated close to 100 liters of water on the stove. We didn't do it once. We didn't do it twice. We didn't do it thrice. We actually did it for four years of pouring buckets of water from the kitchen all the way up. This is how we did water births for four years. And in our fourth year, we actually got our plumbing done and we could afford solar panels in. And when we saw hot water coming out of that pipe, I cannot tell you the joy that we all left as a team. Um, but you know, people ask us, were you crazy to rush water with water buckets up and down all the time? But honestly, that's how much we care for our women, right? So that's how important that was to us. Now, when we look at all our services, what all do we offer? So all elements of classical midwifery, as many women who be, you know, you can look at our pictures, you can see uh, women birthing and skin to skin. And again, when you see the picture right in the middle with a man and bath, now this was a very Indian concept when we started out. Of course, it's different now, but when we started out, it was really, really different. Um, yeah, it was because men were always kept out of the bathroom, right? So that was uh, uh, a whole new venture that we brought to a community. Palpation. Now, this is something that um, I think is very important because when we look at uh, where we are going in the world, changing more in the technocratic model of care with more tests, machines, physical examinations are slowly becoming obsolete. This is something I have noticed. A lot of women tell us when they enter services, I have never been palpated, no one touched my belly. Um, it's really interesting for us to hear that because we are currently in a form of care where e-patients uh, are the focus and, and where the touch of a midwife, uh, which gives the healing effect to the mother, what we call as the hastavasi or the healing touch, is so important. Um, I think uh, it's, it's something to think about is we are increasing the number of medical colleges and medical seats. And where is the future when we are dominated by computers and artificial intelligence? This aspect is really debatable. And policymakers and healthcare providers must give a serious thought to this. This is precisely where we have free education scores, which combines touch and critical thinking, right? Um, now, on my next slide, we will be looking at, uh, again, the other services that we do apart from our free work. We also have healing classes, on a active mama workout classes, another big change maker in the country, uh, all programs financed by midwives, your grandparent classes. We also have the services led by um, the traditional massage therapists in the community. Um, Hannah, all of these are interesting services that we still go forward with because we feel about it's really about pushing our baby. It has to be so much more than that, right? So now when I uh, look at that, our services fit, uh, this is about our team. Like I said, we basically, as a two-member team, 
uh, with our founder, we have grown from there to we are standing right now 17 people on our team, which includes now people who work on social media. Uh, but I think something I would really like to do is how much have we grow. We really don't want to lose our roots. It's important for us to stay in touch with uh, women in the community who still offer hands-on services for mothers and babies. That is something that's really, really important for us right, at Birth Village. Now, this is about our statistics. You can see our statistics from which we've compiled 2010 to 2019. Uh, we have really worked hard to hold this vision and to generate a cultural space for this. Um, it takes a great deal of effort to establish this model over the past uh, 10 years or so, um, especially when we don't have the basic midwifery curriculum in place. You can see all our statistics out there. The natural birth rate, which is 91.93%, a VBAC success rate, 84.81%, the water birth, which is we've been using water for 42.26%, OP position, 1.6%, breach, 0.23%. Uh, you can see our other scores, it's right there, 96.68%. Um, you can also see um, now people have asked us, we get a lot of questions about the episiotomy rate because that is pretty much the norm in hospitals in India, which is close to 99%. For us, it's 1.42%. A lot of these particular, these three factors, we often get questions on, and that's the reason why I inserted this. Uh, we've obviously, um, in India, one of the main reasons today for a C-section is uh, meconium, which is, as I said, a lot here, but we've had 6.9%. We have faced PPH 11.37%, right? So I think it's important to be transparent about all of that as well. You can also see our transferred in labor is 8.96%. And now, interestingly, the OP transfer rate, that is, we also have transferred, we've detected complications in them. Uh, we have seen, we've also given equal importance to women who we feel that maybe free care may not be appropriate. Uh, and that's around 44.61%. So this slide shows us that midwife is really not about natural births or just leading women uh, providing care. It's also where she's able to detect when something is wrong. We are able to do that because our appointments are pretty long and we know all our women really well to detect something, right? So I think there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of, lot of spaces where a woman can interact with a midwife on many different levels. So it's not really just about the births. Now, um, when we go to the next slide, you can see our birth positions and you can see uh, the different positions that we use. It's all out there on our slides here. I can definitely come back to it if you want to have a look at it a little more. Right? So that's the SL stands for sideline. Right, so just to clarify, just put that over there. And um, the next slide also shows us people ask this. Okay, so I need to be clear here that multi also includes. Yeah, multi also includes the V backs because that also has a huge percentage. Right, so we have time ups which is 10.6 and multi pad which is 15.3. Right, so that's one. Um, and then look at this. Uh, last three, this is another quick question that I get. You can see our first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree, all the statistics are pretty much there. Uh, much better, again, including VBACs, uh, first degree, and second degree. This is another important thing because I remember in 2010, one of the biggest questions we got was who would do my episiotomy? And it took us a lot of effort to explain that it's actually not part of an evidence-based practice. That is where our situation was in 2010, right? Data is really important for us. Um, when I go forward to the next slide, you can see the weight of our babies. Now, this is another interesting slide because in India, people consider anything about three kgs as a big baby. Uh, so I, we've tried to tell people that actually it's not so and this is normal. And we also find that the consistent midwifery care babies are definitely more healthier. And this is important for us to relay as well. All right. So um, I hope, yeah, this is also another, this is something that I think has always been one of our plus points is our transfer for an epidural pain relief is zero. Now, 
is something unique, I feel, as far as birthware is concerned. And this completely we attribute it to our women, uh, the education, our birth classes, uh, the commitment of the women who, um, who decide to birth with us. And that's where we get the zero person from. I think it's also about the hands-on comfort measures that we provide. Uh, there are so many reasons. Uh, there are so many reasons as to why we have a 0%. And we have had a lot of midwives who visit us and ask us, how do you keep it at 0%? And I'm happy to explain that probably at the end of my presentation if somebody wants to hear more about it, right? Um, yes, going on to my next slide. Now, apart from uh, healthy, low-risk moms, we have also been there a little bit the box. As you can see in 2018 was also a game changer for us as we had our first breach and our first set of twins. I have to be very honest to say that would we continue doing them or not? It's, I wouldn't say every breach we would try or every set of twins we would try. I would say it really depends on the moms. And the moms, that's really important for us that they're super healthy, uh, they've exercised, um, they are really present uh, spiritually and emotionally for this. Uh, only then would this come into the picture for us, right? Um, and I think that's really important for midwives is that we have that really good conversation with the women that we take care of to really ascertain whether they are the moms that are given for the birth center or not. And I think that's a very individualized uh, decision making as far as each center is concerned. And moving on to my next slide, these are very strong guidelines for us, right? But this is something I think uh, we, I think this is for us that we would like to stress about how relevant midwifery has to be with respect to specific geographic locations. As an Indian woman schooled in midwifery from the United States, this is really important to me. And I've realized what's necessarily huge in the United States may not be here and vice versa. We are burdened today with so many consent forms, and all this does not make any sense to a mother who has barely exercised any choice at all in her life, right from the education to the man she marries, which more or less is chosen by her family. So we are in a very unique position. We talk a lot about choice. We repeat that word so many times, choice, choice, choice. But actually, sometimes we have a mother in front of her who doesn't know how to even do it. So that's where we actually begin from. Right? Uh, and in such situations, writing protocols that have no bearing or meaning, it's obsolete, right? So I think that's important to keep in mind that we need to have a community very strong uh, as the heart of a birth center is concerned. Now, um, this is one of, been a, one of our biggest challenges as far as the birth center is concerned. Isolation being alone, people not really understanding what we are talking about. And it's taken us so many years to reach this point. It's almost like, you know, you feel like you're going round and round in circles all the time. But it's, I hope this picture really is able to uh, relay uh, what we are going through and where we have reached, right? I hope it makes some sense. Um, also, um, to my next slide, I hope you're on time. You know, some things that we changed uh, over the period of time is initially in a birth center, it was mandatory that yes, the support person has to be present. Uh, your support person is mandatory for births. But we changed that around two, three years back when we realized a lot of women may not have their men at birth, may not have supportive families, but this is truly something she wants to do. And we supported those women and we got the men to join in uh, through Zoom and WhatsApp to attend the births. Um, you know, it, it's we changed our mindset a little bit about that. We also have siblings attending births. And uh, it's amazing how families, you know, there's a lot of uh, shame with respect to births and uh, with respect to sex and births and can children, um, is it appropriate for children for to be at births? It's taken us some time to say and teach people that children have no shame. 
should not be positive, it works very differently. It's taken us some time to really uh, show our community that it's really okay and that we actually really did have uh, older sisters and brothers at first. It's just that the past 50 years or so, things have been a little bit upside down, right? Um, so I think we reached that point where we have made those changes calmly in our community. This is one thing that every birth center or midwife obviously will bank on, and that's where birth blood stands on. We grow not because of anything else but this uh, financial word, which is trust, right? This is a big, big thing. Without this, we couldn't have come this far, right? So I think that's a big thing. Um, now, when we look at, I'm sorry, the slide just went really fast, sorry. I'm just going back again. Now, when you look at the uh, midwifery model, this is how I have kind of divided it into four quadrants. So you have the business aspect, you have the practical side about it, you have your theoretical knowledge that you need, and the impact is obviously on families. You need to really picturize your work in this manner, like the four quadrants. And you really need to write down where and what you're doing in each quadrant. This is really, it's almost like you're, it's not a business plan, but it's like the first step that you need to establish as to where you're working and do this exercise for yourself. The next thing that I have seen is this. Now, where are we doing right now? Okay, let's look at me. So if you look, you can see uh, there are this building blocks, sexual and reproductive health clinic, women's health centers, midwifery schools, and digital platforms. Let's look at this. this is something I think that's interesting because when you look at this, you will see that the incubation and creation models require resources apart from your personal funds. You may need donors, you may need free, uh, sectors, you may need a lot more investment, which help in promoting, innovating, adopting scalability and sustainability. Right now, look at sexual reproductive health clinics. What does that mean? It could be let my midwives. A uh, new vision for quality care, more competent services that serve women. You could have uh, clinical consultations, you could add on other services if you want, uh, child birth preparation, you could even have obstetric support, uh, providing specialized doctors, emergency care, private rooms, breastfeeding counseling, pediatric consultation, everything. So, so sexual and reproductive health clinics literally mean uh, the whole gamut of services. You have this. Second option, which is women's health centers. Now, this is slightly different. Um, now, this is basically helping women to achieve the birth of their choice. Now, in this, it could be dedicated uh, slightly differently, kind of providing additional services like prenatal yoga, childbirth preparation classes. It need not be focused on births per se, but it could provide, it could, you could have support by a midwife. Um, maybe in a birth in the hospital with the support of a midwife or doula, yoga sessions. That's how women have centers function, right? You could have midwifery schools. Um, now, this model requires the creation of spaces to educate midwives. This model is really essential for the creation and ongoing viability of the entire midwifery system. Uh, you're using human capital. Midwifery schools, again, can be integrated with business models already proposed. Can be stand alone, partnering with other models, right? So that's that's a different services or a separate, separate uh, business aspect. Another one that's obviously coming forward is digital platforms. Now, you could use this. Somebody could be using this to promote midwifery, disseminating information efficacy. Uh, midwives can use this, uh, sites content to gain media exposure, network with potential clients. From an economic standpoint, this model has a potential to add value to all the other models described, right? So this is how uh, I would say different building blocks going forward are going to be. Now, the existing models what we have in India, obviously, are hospitals and centers. And the participants, I kind of put them down, right? So now, interestingly, most people would think sexual and reproductive health are, you know, if you're going to look from a, uh, let's talk from a money perspective or cash angle, but actually going forward, it's going to be women's health centers. 
Uh, that's the one that's likely to break even faster. The slowest might be the digital platforms. Uh, but the investment, for example, you could, let's say, an average something $50 to access a digital platform, uh, which is quite less. Uh, but um, that particular business model works on volume. Digital platform works on volumes, right? So there's different ways to look at these uh, business angles. And like are obviously women, midwives, midwives in training, trainers, parents, healthcare providers, and evaluators. Now, in my uh, next slide, I think this is an important one for all of you workers out there. We are constant multitaskers. A single birth worker who doesn't identify with this picture, right? But this is International Midwife Day, and I think there's some important points. And I'm not just talking about our own kids. I think the first concept of circle of support at the end of all is family. There is a need, you know, the need is there to be for persons who are with you when you're younger, and they definitely need you as they grow older. I'm talking about our own parents, right? Uh, I think it's important to introspect, to communicate, um, you know, have a dialogue with yourself. An inward journey actually takes you further, um, it makes you, takes you much more further than you expect. Uh, it gives you much more better aspiration to find your absolute power. I think that's very, very important, right? And as one more thing in the slide, you can see that laptop, this is media. You know, this is, uh, I have different viewpoints on this. It's a re-engineering, right, by technological companies with a profit uh, motive rather than social good. It thrives on an underlying human addiction, which is a desire to get noticed, right? I think as midwives, it's so important we're able to leverage our time and our sanity for the greater without really chasing likes because honestly, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. That old rat race doesn't matter, right? And that's one thing that um, I think I've been talking about a lot. Now people have asked me, where are we going forward? And this is how we're going to look in probably the end of this year is our new center, which we're hopefully a few months away from opening. We make this decision. We are growing from a freestanding birth center to a family uh, birthing center. Now, as a midwife, I should honestly say that I'm not a person who's really interested in an OT, etc. But there have been many incidents in my life. Our transfer rate is very, very low, as you can see. But even if I do 99 births naturally, the one birth that I will always think about is the birth that I treat for a C-section. And that is the hardest. When you go and visit your mom who you had a transfer, both mom and two baby are doing fine. Babies are in the NICU. And the mom asks us painfully, can you do something to bring that baby to me? And we are Priyanka? Helpless because it's another institution. Yes? Priyanka, we're Hello? going to need to close the room down in three minutes. Sure. Maybe you have time for one more question. Yeah, sure. So yes, um, yes. If anybody would like to ask a question, maybe I should start my presentation with that. Yeah, definitely ask any questions and sort of the capacity. Yeah. yeah. So we've we've probably got time for one question. Yes. Okay. So Kaveri is saying. Could you share any regulatory challenges that you may have faced to practice midwifery in India? So, yeah, so uh, currently my license is equalized in India, so I really don't face that at this point of time. It's taken a couple of years to get that organized, at least I would say six years to get that done. But right now, it's it has not been easy because people never really understood what direct entry midwifery is because that's what I am. But there are others on my team who obviously are nurse midwives. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. We've got a couple of minutes. What if a no. gynecologist wants to do midwifery? Of course, why not? Absolutely. <laughs> why not? There is uh, there's definitely 
definitely scope for that and that's definitely an option. Okay, one more, few more. Got, do they need a separate degree? Yes, so midwifery and gynecology is two different things and definitely you will need to have a separate set of training for midwifery. It's a lot of people say, but you know, I want, I'm a gynecologist, I can do midwifery. It is not, it's as much as a midwife is not a gynecologist and a gynecologist is not a midwife. That's just it. It's two separate compartments. Okay. They will, and Jane says, they will need extra training for the lower risk. Yeah, that's correct, Jane. I agree with you on that. Okay, I think we've got one more minute. So I'm going to sort of make a couple of closing comments. In the Thank you so much. Um, I think this was great for all of us to see. And I mean, those statistics, wow. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I think uh, this session was uh, very useful. Uh, I think if I can summarize one thing, you you focus really well on this this cultural appropriate. I mean, how do you tweak midwifery to be hyper local and relevant? I think, uh, and then you shared uh, very honest journeys of how you've made that change. So, thank you very right. much, Priyanka. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh -huh.